We have three short readings tonight and all of them will be on the screen. But if you want to look the first one up, we're in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 and verses 1 to 4. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And our second few verses are from Isaiah chapter 40, uh, starting at verse 10. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And our third short passage is from John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. If it is uh, handy for you to turn to page 1220, we will be referring to 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, the first few verses, which are our verses for this evening, but also referring back to a few verses from the previous chapter. Uh, let me start off by telling you a story. Um, one, one time a, a long uh, period ago when we lived and ministered in Dublin, I went for a hike in the Dublin Hills with one of the young men in the congregation, somebody a bit like Peetsy, and but it wasn't. And this uh, young Christian lad was one of the cool boys and uh, one of the ways he demonstrated his coolness was by smoking. So when we got to the top of the mountain, he lit up a cigarette and started to puff. Uh, I then brought out a cigar and asked him for a light. <laughs> he nearly fell off the rock he was sitting on, <laughs> and he was clearly shocked that his minister was also about to smoke until that is through my uncontrollable laughter, he realized that my realistic looking cigar was in fact made out of chocolate. <laughs> A little while later, I asked him how he had felt uh, when his mentor requested him for a light. And he replied, I felt disappointed. Isn't that interesting? Shortly after this, cool young man gave up smoking. I mention that story because 1 Peter 5 verse 3 tells us that elders are to be examples to the flock. And forgive me if I trivialize that by focusing uh, on something as small as smoking. But being an example to those for whom we exercise pastoral care does not mean that Christians aim to be the same as other people. No different. But rather that we seek in so far as it is possible to be like the chief shepherd of God's flock, even Jesus our Lord, who laid down his life for his sheep. So we just pray together. Gracious Lord, loving Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word and to this particular passage that happens to be the one prescribed for tonight, 
please will you speak into our context, leading us to repentance and faith, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, last week, our Kirk session resolved to request the East Belfast Presbytery's permission for us to elect a number of new elders in the new year. So what we're reading about tonight is certainly timely, uh, A, for those who are already elders here in Bloomfield, B, for those who are under the providence of God may be elected elders, and C, indeed for all of us who have responsibility to vote for our new elders. So here then is very helpful instruction for us all. Do you see chapter 5, verse 1? To the elders among you, I, Peter, appeal as a fellow elder, he says, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed, be shepherds of God's flock under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but by being examples to the flock. So speaking to these poor, benighted, early church believers scattered throughout Asia Minor, experienced persecution for their faith in the Lord Jesus, Peter speaks specifically not to individual Christians, but collectively to those who exercise pastoral care for others. And so this is God's Word for you. And there are a number of things that immediately leap out of the page and merit exploring this evening. And the first being this, why would anybody want to be an elder? And that really is a good question. Is it for status? Is it for social standing? Is it for public recognition? Well, let's be honest, for some maybe it used to be. Perhaps for some in some places it still is, I don't know. Although I suspect it's very different now compared to, say, 50 years ago, when it was kind of assumed that the doctor, the headmaster, and the bank manager would naturally be on Kirk session. But what that was then? Uh, what about at the time that this was written? What about now? Well, Peter's letter has precious little to say about the worldly benefits which being an elder confers. It's not for financial gain, verse 2, is it? It's not out of any sense of compulsion, again, verse 2. Nobody's forcing somebody to become an elder. It's not for status, because in those days and today, those who stand up for Jesus and His Word are not lauded, but are more likely to be laughed at. So if it's none of those things, what is it about? Well, it has everything to do with service. Serve as overseers, verse 2. Not because you must, but because you're willing, eager to serve. So what benefit then is there for the woman or the man who aspires to be an elder? None, except verse 2 that you are doing what God wants you to do. That is exercising pastoral care for those for whom you have specific responsibility and serving as overseers of God's flock, even as Jesus modeled. In other words, caring for people in a way that a shepherd looks after and cares for his sheep. Now, where does this idea of pastoral care come from? And the answer, of course, verse 4, is from Jesus Himself, from Jesus, who is the chief shepherd, from Jesus, who John in his gospel, chapter 10, tells us is the good shepherd. It can't be coincidence, can it, that many of the people God called to care for His people in the Old Testament literally were shepherds before they became established leaders. Do you remember Moses, who long before he was 
leading God's people out of slavery to bring them to the edge of the promised land. Moses was a shepherd in the wilderness of Midian. Or King David, who long before he was Israel's leader, was a shepherd who protected his flock from the wolf and the bear. And then after the Lord Jesus, what was it Jesus himself said to Peter, who was writing these very words? What command did Jesus give the repentant, humbled Peter after his denial and restoration of Jesus beside the Sea of Galilee? Peter, he says, feed my sheep. Peter, I want you to take care of my lambs. Peter, you have been entrusted with the responsibility and the privilege not only to look after yourself, but to provide spiritual and pastoral care for those who are part of the flock of God. So practically then, what does that look like? What does pastoral care for the sheep entail? Well, for the answer to that, it's sometimes interesting to see what it doesn't entail. And so there's a very interesting passage in Acts chapter 6, which you may find interesting to turn up. It's page 1098, Acts chapter 6, 1098. The church at this time had been growing at a tremendous rate. Do you see that in chapter 6, verse 1? Uh, In those days, the number of disciples were increasing And the workload of caring for some of the widows was becoming so great for the leaders of the early church that the twelve apostles gathered everybody together and said in verse 2, look, we just can't do it all. And then I'm paraphrasing here when I go on and say, if we do storehouse, we haven't enough time to write Sunday's sermon Storehouse is good, storehouse is vital, but it's not right that we, the 12 leaders trained by Jesus for three years, neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. So, because of that, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and let them get on with this important work. And we will do what it is that we have been called to do, that is to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So here in Acts chapter 6, we have what we might describe as a differentiation between committee people and Kirk Session people. Both note are spiritual people. Can you see that? We need holy people looking after our finances. It is necessary for spirit-filled people to be able to take care of our property and practically helping the vulnerable people. That is a spiritual job. These things are critical for the health and welfare of our church community. But, and here's the point, they mustn't be distracted from those things which are their primary calling, and that is to teach and to pray. What is it that elders are primarily called to do? No, no, let me rephrase that. What is it that elders are primarily called to be? And the answer is, if committee people are to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, so elders need to be as well. Elders are called to be spirit-filled, spirit-led people. And elders are entrusted with two specific and particular tasks, prayer and teaching the Scriptures, praying with and praying for those for whom they have pastoral responsibility, using the Bible to encourage and build up and instruct others in holy living. And that's what we want to be looking for in our elders, people who pray, people who are able to instruct people in the living Word. Now, now maybe this is timely 
for us all. It's easy for elders. It's easy for any of us who are Christian leaders in the church to get distracted by doing a million good things. But simply doing good may not be our primary calling. Those entrusted with the Christ-like responsibility of exercising pastoral care for God's flock must do what they alone can do, and that is to pray for other people and read the Scriptures to and with other people. What makes a minister, for example, different from a social worker? Social workers are vital. Don't get me wrong. But unless the minister brings God's perspective into a congregation or into a person's life or into a home, he or she has missed the plot. And what makes an elder's visit to a home or a hospital bed different from, say, a member of the family or a neighbor? It's that by virtue of their pastoral calling, they bring the people to God and bring God, God's presence into the lives of the people. That's the elders' calling, prayer and teaching the Scriptures. I was in a situation just recently when a church leader had a unique and particular opportunity to bring God's Word into a situation of dire and urgent need. And I'm grieved to say that sadly, tragically, he spectacularly failed to deliver. Listen, says Peter, to the elders among you. I appeal to you. I beg you, as a fellow elder, be shepherds of God's flock that are under your care being examples to the flock. Now, just before we conclude, there's one other thing that Peter highlights, which I wonder if you have noticed I've not really mentioned, and it's found in chapter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you, and remember this is also re relevant to any who are entrusted with any kind of spiritual leadership among other people, whether it be uh, at school scripture union or crusader class or kid zone or boys brigade or guides or creche, house group, as a teacher, in parents and toddlers or in hospitality, PW or bowls, I appeal to you as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings. Here's Peter appealing to spiritual leaders to lead in a spiritual way, the way of the Lord Jesus. The role you have been called to exercise is a costly responsibility. And Peter, we know, was an eyewitness to the cost which Jesus experienced as Jesus suffered. Jesus, the chief shepherd suffered. I witnessed that suffering of Jesus, says Peter. I saw it with my very own eyes. Peter was in the garden of Gethsemane as the Lord Jesus cried out to God, his heavenly Father, if possible, please, Lord, remove this cup. And Peter would have said, I observed this with my very own eyes as the Lord Jesus stood naked and humiliated before Herod and Pilate as he was mocked and whipped. I watched him on the cross as he cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If Jesus suffered like that for you, says Peter, if Jesus suffered for me so that together we may have a message of forgiveness 
and everlasting hope to share with people who otherwise would have no hope, then, dear friends, chapter 4, verse 12, please don't be surprised if you, also as leaders of God's flock, experience painful trials. The eldership isn't about status. It's actually about suffering. Don't be surprised, therefore, if as you carry out your spiritual leadership tasks and responsibilities, you get insulted. Don't be surprised if you experience persecution or if you're made to feel ashamed of being a Christian leader, don't be surprised by any of these things, because this actually is part of the package. This is what it means to be a shepherd of God's flock. And even as Jesus set this example for us, to the extent of laying down His life for the sheep, so now, verse 3, that is the example that we ought to show to others entrusted to our pastoral care. Some of you know that in recent days, I have experienced some painful trials in the media. Things have been said in the press and in the social media that have been highly critical and personally insulting. Well, chapter 4, verse 12 says, don't be surprised. Peter says, don't be surprised as if something strange were happening to you. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. I'm having to apply this scripture to myself. If you are insulted because of the name of Jesus, verse 14, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests in you. But do you know something? I suspect that in the not too distant future, and judging from this morning's life builder led by Karen about the proposed abortion legislation here in Northern Ireland, in the not too distant future, it will not only be your minister who will be insulted for commending biblical truth won't only be elders or leaders in the church seeking to be faithful to the Lord Jesus, to be ridiculed or given a difficult time by people who know nothing of Christ or His Word. Before we know it, teachers and nurses and obstetricians and gynecologists, as indeed some business people have already discovered to their cost, it will be really hard to be Christ's, to honor His holy name. But, 1 Peter 4, verse 16, if that happens to you, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear His name. And when the chief shepherd appears, chapter 5, verse 4, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. The world may seek to remove worldly honors from those who honor the Lord Jesus. But when the chief shepherd comes, he will bestow honors that will never, ever be removed, that will last forever and ever So to him be all honor and glory, both now and forever. Let us pray. And as we thank God for his pastoral care for us, so it is our prayer that having been pastored by Jesus, 
who even now is interceding for us and who has fed us with his word. It is our prayer that strengthened, encouraged, and enabled we may be better equipped to go from here to face whatever challenges and opportunities tomorrow brings. And rely not only on ourselves and our own inadequate resources, but to rely fully on the chief shepherd and his totally adequate resources. all we pray is in the name and for the sake of Christ our Lord.